If super cold air conditioning was your desire in the 1970s and you were looking for a new car, chances are a General Motors vehicle would at least be on your list. GM's A6 style compressor, shown here, as well as its overall AC system, was world renowned for its high cooling capacity and overall effectiveness. It's for this reason that GM cooling systems were employed not only by General Motors, but also by automakers like Rolls-Royce, Jaguar, Ferrari, and even Ford Motor Company starting in 1972 on the Lincoln lineup. Now, GM AC systems had all the same components that other AC systems had, a compressor, a condenser, an expansion valve, and an evaporator. But they were highly effective in part because of the unique compressor design and also the high system capacity. Now, when operating the air conditioning from the passenger compartment, GM systems operated like most other systems, but there were some strange features and operational items that only GM employed. Let's investigate one of the strange features that helped keep customers cool on a hot day, but certainly is strange, especially by modern day standards. Well, here we have the underhood of my 1973 Olds Cutlass, and you can see the big honkin' GMA6 air conditioning compressor right there. That's the heart of the beast in the VIR setup, the dryer under hood. But we're going to talk about a feature of General Motors air conditioning in the 1970s that is certainly wonky. And it'll be something that you remember. So be sure to comment in the comment section if you remember this. I haven't seen a car before or since that employed something similar. So let's turn now to the inside and talk about this particular feature that helped keep customers cool. Okay, here we are inside the 1973 Cutlass. This car, as you see, has 6,076 miles. I think it had 4,100 when I bought it, and it's hard not to drive it because it's a great driving car. But onto the air conditioning setup over here. By the way, you have a really cool feature that this lighting uh, on the overall HVAC control panel isn't necessarily unique, but I thought this was cool. It's kind of a blue-green light, a little bit hard to tell, but it is bluish-green, and then if you want it to be a map light, you flick the switch, and all it does is it moves the blue-green shade out of, the, out of the way. I thought that was pretty cool. These aren't backlit. These are just lit from the front. But as I was mentioning, these have a really interesting setup for the air conditioning that wasn't employed by other automakers. Now, this setup would be pretty typical. Ford and Chrysler would have something similar on their HVAC controls. But one thing that GM did that was a little bit different was that when you turned the air conditioning on, you can hear the fan now in the vent setting. And then if you put the air conditioning on, it's going to move and have the air come out the upper outlets. So that was the main determinant. And you can move the fan speed up and down here, which is typical. But on these HVAC controls, there's a little detent that starts right about here. And you notice right now the fan is on this medium speed. But if I push this all the way to cold, watch what happens. Hear the fan speeds kick up. It's even more dramatic if I flip this down a notch. Watch. Hear that? So you move it past this detent. This is the recirc setting. So the only time that the air conditioning would be on the recirc setting is if this lever is past that detent onto the cold section. And some of the GM vehicles even had a little marking to designate that that would be, I'll call it the extra cold setting. So if you do that in these other positions like vent, let's just turn the key on, you'll notice I can move into that detent and the fan doesn't speed up, nothing happens, or in the heater position. But as soon as I go to air conditioning, you can hear the high blower kick on. So I don't know of any other domestic company that really employed that approach aside from General Motors. Ford would have, it wasn't really a detent, but if you kept pushing the temperature slider to the left, 
it would eventually open the research door, which was often in the kick panel area down there. But it didn't kick the fan speed all the way on high like the GMs did. So again, just a overall different approach than what General Motors employed. This would go away in the latter part of the 1970s for whatever reason. Maybe people like me just said that they wanted to have, you know, the cold air blowing, but not the high, the high fan speed. And GM would then change its HVAC controls. But for many years, in particular in the 1970s, this was the setup and what it looked like. Now, the other thing that happens when you move this over to air conditioning, as well as have it in this cold setting over here, the one thing that happens when you move it over to that cold setting is that it also shuts off the coolant flow into the heater core. There normally is coolant flow into the heater core, but the blend mode door is not passing a lot of air over the heater core. That's why you get cold air from the outlets here. But in the maximum setting, and this is true for Ford as well, when you push that lever all the way to the left, it blocks off the coolant flow from the heater core. There's a little heater valve up there under hood that precludes the coolant from flowing in. And then as soon as you move this lever over, then it allows heater or coolant to flow into the heater core. And that is just another feature that makes the air conditioning in these cars super, super cold. So you have the maximum recirc feature, which is different. I don't even think GM had a they never really had a recirc button. They switched to the HVAC sliders that had a maximum position and a normal position eventually, which was very popular on almost every GM car in the 1980s where you had that two slider setup that looked like this with the fan control. But in the 70s, this was how they did it. One last thing I'll say about these air conditioning systems, if you want to recharge it yourself. First of all, these systems are charged originally on R12. You can tell this system has never been retrofitted. It doesn't have any of the blue or red caps on the lower or the high side. And if you get R12, then you can recharge it with that. Or if it's recharged on R134A, you can just buy that at the store and do it yourself. But one of the things that you can do on these, if they're still charged on R12, there's a little sight glass over there. And you basically want to keep charging the system until the air is cold in that side class, you don't see any more bubbles in it. That doesn't work with the R134A systems. A lot of people recommend recharging if you've converted these to not fill them with the same amount of weight of R134A as the R12 that was in there, but about 80%. So if this system is about a four pound system, if you were to switch this over to R134A, you'd use about 80% of four pounds about 3.2 pounds of R134A refrigerant. So that's about three pounds, three ounces, roughly. But that's one of the things that you can do if your system needs to be recharged. I would recommend though, R12 is expensive. You might wanna have somebody pull a vacuum on the system and see if it holds before you do that. Because then at least you know that it's not gonna leak out in a day or two days may take a year, may take a couple years. Often these systems, if they're not used a lot, will tend to leak out eh, every two or three years. I find I have to recharge this one. It's not an every year thing, but I just put a can in it every two or three years and it's back to working like it should. So I hope you enjoyed that spotlight on what makes these GM air conditioning setups pretty cool. Thanks again for watching.